happy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Liz. Always an absolute pleasure to be online here with Local Land Services. I really enjoy these presentations and I really love the kind of engagement we get from the audience too. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, along that note, for everybody who has just joined us, we've asked everyone at the very beginning to write their name, their um, postcode and their favourite beneficial invertebrate into the chat there so we can see where everyone's coming from. Now, as Liz said, today we're going to be talking about insects and invertebrates the ecosystem services. There's actually a huge amount of um, benefits of having insects, and we're talking just about a very small piece of that pie today. How to identify different natural enemies in cropping systems specifically, but also this applies across many other systems, that these would be beneficials across many different cropping and garden systems. And we're going to get some new information on the toxicity of different pesticides groups to beneficial insects, and that's the, the section that Rob is giving at the end. So if we're talking about ecosystem services, I mean, this is a very human centric approach. Um, it's basically looking at the advantages we get for having nature around us. And insects provide a huge number of benefits to humans. I think a lot of the general public don't realize just how important insects are to the functioning of our ecosystems. Um, and especially what we're talking about today um, is gonna be pest control at the top here. Most people would recognise pollination as being a really important, um, uh, a really important um, ecosystem service. Everybody knows that bees are needed for pollination. Um, uh, also, you know, insects and bees are a really important um, source of food for not just birds but reptiles and mammals as well in our ecosystems. As this idea that you know, if we got rid of all the insects, there'd be nothing for a lot of other animals to eat. Um, and also decomposition. So a lot of people, you know, you talk about soil health, but you don't really know what it comes down to. Often it's down to these microorganisms and these insects and invertebrates that are in the soil. And that's really, really important for creating healthy soils. Um, this little one at the top here is seed dispersal, which is basically just that there are particular ants that these native plants need in order to take these seeds and bury them somewhere else, which is a completely different lecture altogether. But today we're talking about pest control. So we're talking about predators to start off with, and we've got a list of predators here, things like ladybirds, beetles, hoverflies, lacewings, predatory mites and spiders. And I'm going to go over today uh, some details about how we can identify these different groups, because it's not always easy. We're also going to play a little game. We're going to play pest or pal in the, in the Zoom polls. I'm going to show you a picture of an invertebrate. You have to guess if it's a pest or pal, so pal would be a beneficial insect. Uh, and then you have to vote in the Zoom poll. So let's give it a go with this one. I'm going to launch the first poll. And I want everybody to take a guess as to whether this is pest or pal. Got some good answers coming in. Oh, it's pretty split. We've had lots of people vote. Now, for anybody who wrote pest, can you write the justification for it in the chat for me, please? I'd love to see what comes through. I, this may be a slight trick question. I love everyone that's put pal because, you know, ladybirds are beneficial insects. 60% of people have said pal and 40% of people have said pest, which means that some people are onto my little trick. There we go. This one's a pest. It was definitely a trick question um, because this is a 28 spotted ladybird. And there's a couple of people in the chat that already know this, which is fantastic. Basically, lots of spots means it's a pest. Um, there are most ladybirds are predators. We'll talk a little bit about them. Um, but these ones can feed on quite a lot of different crops. So we keep an eye out for them. So lady beetles, um, I love these as a beneficial insect because they are predators both as larvae and as adults. You might notice these tiny little yellow eggs, you might have recognised them being somewhere. Um, and these really, really interesting looking larvae. Lots of people kind of recognise them but don't realise that this is what a baby ladybird looks like. They're really, really spiky. They're often black and yellow. And they've got these quite big jaws at the front there, which is a really good indicator that they're predators. Then they pupate into a little ball like this, and then they come out as a gorgeous ladybird. 
And you may just notice one or two um, different species, but there's actually over 6,000 species of ladybird in the world and over 500 species in Australia. And we do have, you know, these common spotted ladybirds. They're really, really good predators, especially of things like aphids. We've also got mealybug ladybirds that specialise in eating mealybugs, even fungus ladybirds. And there's this picture here that now of the 28 spotted ladybird, which is one of the very, very few species which is actually a herbivore and a pest. So here's our next one. Let me launch the next poll. That was the results of the last one. Now we're going to launch this one. Okay, who wants to tell me whether this is a pest or pal? I'll give you a hint, it's a beetle. Not a very good hint though, because beetles are one of the most diverse groups of insects out there. A little bit of a split. I'll give you one more second and then I'm going to share the results and see what we come up with. Let me share these results with you. So 22% think it's a pest and 78% think it's a pal. This one is a pal. So this is a carabid beetle. They're quite big usually. You can you find them in the soil. They're kind of ground dwelling beetles and they can either reduce weeds, they can eat weeds, but they also eat pests because they're quite good predators. They're very, very variable, um, but they do, again, have these forward-facing mouth parts. If you ever see these big chompers, it's a good indication that this is going to be a predator. Also the long, strong legs. So if we have a look at this guy, it gives us an idea. So they talk about this hot water bottle body shape, um, and that's quite well, unique among the beetles. There are so many different species of beetles, 2,500 just in Australia. So you're never gonna be able to identify even a tiny selection of them. And they're very, very diverse. But if we're trying to work out what a carabid beetle looks like, they often have these long kind of stripes on the back part of their body and these big, strong legs and bulgy eyes. As um, larva, it's a little bit more difficult because again, super variable. These two are both carabid beetles, but they can tell they look quite different. Um, they tend to have these longer kind of processes at the end of their body. And again, look at these jaws. Even as, as um, larva, they've got those big noticeable jaws. So don't just assume that any kind of little wriggly thing that's in your soil is gonna be a pest chomping on the roots. These guys are actually the good guys. Here's another one. This is also a beetle. I'll launch my pole. What do we reckon with this one? Pest or pal? This might not be one that you've encountered before. But I've given you a few hints already as to how we might be able to identify what kind of things it feeds on, whether it's a predator or not. And getting pretty good response here as well. I love that everyone's voting, by the way. Thank you. It's really, really lovely to see all these votes come through. It means I know you're listening. <laughs> Yeah, excellent. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm just super quick with these ones. I'm gonna end that one. I'll share it with you. Most people are on the money with this one. This is a vegetable beetle. You may have heard of wireworms or false wireworms before that can attack cereals. Moving on from the beetles, let's talk about Rob's favorite, the hoverflies. Um, these are absolutely fascinating little insects, um, often mistaken for bees because they've actually evolved that way. So they've evolved to look like a bee because Generally, you don't want to eat a bee. You, you know that you'll get stung if you come along and eat a bee. Um, these guys don't have any stingers. They're flies, not bees. You can see they've only got one pair of legs. But they've worked out that if you look a lot like a bee, then you're much less likely to get eaten. That's why they look that way. So they've got these tiny little antennas at the front, big fly-like eyes, which is a good way to identify them as well, and a really flat body as well if you see them from on the side. And the hoverfly it really does what it says on the name too. Sometimes you'll go out into the garden or the field and you'll see them just hovering around. It's a really beautiful look. Um, and again, one set of wings so that we know that it's a fly and not a bee. But as larvae, they look quite like a fly larvae you would expect. They're quite maggoty and pretty nondescript. This one here is hanging out with a whole lot of aphids because it's eating them, which is another good thing. This is another one of those ones that is a really, really good predator when it's in its larval stages. So they're kind of a greeny brown color, but the most defining feature is this kind of white stripe that often goes down the back. And they've got these kind of like hook-like mouth parts, which they actually grab 
and pull in the aphids with them. Um, it's quite fascinating to see if you can ever, ever keep, um, keep an eye on a, um, a, a hoverfly. Uh, here's a, a different little critter for you. I'll launch my next poll. What do we reckon with this one? Pest or pal, you might recognize this one from your own gardens. They're pretty ferocious looking beasts. And they seem to have something on their backs. Something a bit weird's going on there. And this has taken a little, people a little bit longer to come through with their results. I'll, I'll let you have one half another minute to, to have a think about it. I will say I actually found one of these in my house the other day, which was very strange. Not what you would have expected. They don't usually live inside, but a pleasant surprise nonetheless. Okay, 32% say pest, 68% say pal. This one's a pal. So again, this is the larval stage and this is a beautiful lacewing larvae. They are amazing predators, very, very good at controlling aphids. Um, and some of them put this weird debris on their back. Sometimes they even collect the carcasses of the, of the food they've already eaten, put it on their back and carry it around as camouflage. And if you ever see one, they really do look just like a kind of a little scrap of, of something that's crawling along. So let's talk a little bit more about lace wings. Again, there's quite a few different species. You're looking at um, the most common ones are the brown lace wing and the green lace wing that we would see in Australia. You probably recognize their eggs, but you might not have known what they were. They lay their eggs on a long stalk with the egg on the end and often in kind of a horseshoe shape as well. Um, often up underneath balconies and things. I've got loads at my house at the moment and they hatch out into those tiny little grubs with the big nippers. So the way you distinguish an adult lacewing, they've got these really big eyes, clear folded wings, hence the name, and very long antennae. So they're kind of different from a dragonfly in that they fold these wings right back over their body. And these are the larvae. So again, they look a little bit different between the two species. The green lacewing is the one that carries them on their back, but they do have these really big sickle shaped jaws at the front and a tapering body at the back. Now, people generally think of mites as being a bad thing, but there are actually lots of species of predatory mite, which can be really good predators. And we definitely want to encourage, especially in cropping systems. So the Boletidae, the Antisidae and the Megos Megostigmata um, are all really good positive mites that we want to be having in systems. Now, mites are always going to be very, very hard to identify. These do look quite different from the main pests, such as the red-legged earth mite, in that, that they usually have a big um, black body, and these ones are quite red. Um, but I'm not going to expect any of you to be able to go out into a field and instantly identify a mite, unless you've got a really good microscope. But I can tell you, they do have slightly different behavior. So these ones here, they, they, the whirligig mite, they move around in little circles. Um, they're usually not clumped in groups like a pest mite would be. Um, and these ones are easy. These are the snout mites. So they've got a big point. When I say easy, these guys are still teeny, teeny, tiny. So you've got to be able to get a good look at them. Um, but we know that they're a mite because they've got that one big body part rather than multiple segments like an insect. Got another pest or pal. Now this one is a bit harder. Get my pole up. Next one. It might be hard at first even to work out what kind of insect we're looking at here. I can tell you that it is a beetle larva, but do we know whether it's a pest or pal? Still got lots of votes coming through, which is absolutely wonderful. 70% of people have put their votes through. It's looking pretty good. Okay, I'm going to end that one. And this one is a pest. So we're looking at these false wireworms again. This is the eastern false wireworm. And you'll see that the mouth parts are quite different to those carabid beetles and the predatory beetles. They've got small downward pointing mouth parts. And that's an indicator that it's going to be a pest because it might be chewing on things like roots and, um, and foliage. So again, it's, it's really hard to actually work out what species you've got unless you're a beetle expert, 
But if you can have a look at some of these general features, that can be a little bit helpful. Now, I just had to put this one in here because my background is in spider biology and I'm very, very passionate about them and all the benefits that they bring. Um, spiders are another one of those super, super diverse groups in that there is over 40,000 species worldwide. We've got over 3,500 species that we know about in Australia, but there's lots more that haven't had nearly enough work on them, done on them yet. And the great thing about spiders as predators is they're generalists, so they eat all sorts of stuff. And if you have a diverse group of spiders, then they're able to control a diverse um, community of pests. You've got some that are um, kind of foliage dwellers that jump around like jumping spiders and link spiders, ground dwellers like the um, wolf spiders, got huntsmen, which will generally be on the bark um, of trees, crab spiders, which camouflage themselves in, in um, flowers and then sit there waiting for um, pollinators to come in. So, you know, generalist means that they don't always get the bad guys, sometimes they get the good guys too. And the orb weaving spiders, which are, of course, really good for catching moths and flies. Um, I could literally give a whole nother hour talk on spiders, so I will move on because otherwise I'll get stuck. <laughs> I think this is our last pestle pal. I'll, I'll share that last poll. Uh, next one coming up. Give me an idea about what you think for this one. The larva stages, stages are always going to be really hard. And I mean, it's one thing to see a, a grub that's up on the screen. Oh, I'll just get everyone to go into mute. There we go. Thank you. Um, but it's another thing entirely to actually be looking at these critters out in the soil. Oh, most people answered. A couple more coming through. But I'll end that one now. This one's a bit more split. 33% say pest, 67% say pal. This one is a pal. So if we have a close look at it, these big pointy jaws at the front here. And this is the larvae of the carabid beetle. So carabids are really quite common. That's the reason I've got them up twice. And it's something that we always get loads and loads of questions about. So I like to kind of introduce these to people as actually really beneficial things to have in their gardens. Sometimes people kind of take uh, a broader approach to pest control and they see, you know, all these beetles crawling around in the soil and they think that it might not be a good thing, but that's not always the case. So again, we can see these nice forward facing mouth parts. So now I get to talk about an equally fascinating subject, which is parasitoids. And we were talking about beetles being diverse, but there's actually the, the theory out there that parasitoids are even more diverse. Basically, for every species of insect out there, you've probably got a couple of parasitoids to go along with it. The current um, thinking is that there's probably over 500,000 species of parasitoid, but to be honest, we just really don't know. There was a, even a news story that came out yesterday that said that we, what we thought was one species is actually 16 different species of wasp. So again, I'm not gonna ask you to identify these individually. You're never gonna be able to work out what actual species we've got of these wasps. I wouldn't be able to either. But we can think about generally the kind of jobs that they're doing, what kind of pests they might be attacking and how we can encourage them. Um, the other thing is they can be teeny, teeny, tiny, like one millimetre kind of tiny. Um, but the way that we can tell a parasitoid wasp um, from a larger kind of stingy social wasp is they've got this very, very long ovipositor at the back. And the name says, it, um, says what it does, ovi egg. This is how they lay their eggs. So this is kind of how they either inject their eggs into their host, which I'll talk about in a sec, or lay their eggs on top of the host. People kind of see that sometimes and they're petrified because they think it's a stinger, but these, these wasps will never sting you. They don't have a sting. They have no capacity to sting, but they will lay their eggs in caterpillars. Um, and this is the size comparison for European wasps. So this is like the biggest possible parasitoid wasp, and this is the smallest. They are very, very small. Now, within this group of wasps, we have both generalists and specialist species. So there are some parasitoid wasps that will only lay their eggs in one particular type of pest, um, but they can control, you know, across the diversity of parasitoid wasps that we know of, they can control a huge range of pests. Very, very common for knowing to um, control for caterpillars, also for pest beetles, aphids, true bugs, and basically if there's a pest, then you can look for a parasitoid to control it. 
And that's some of the really, really interesting work that we do at CESA. You basically go out, collect a whole lot of stuff, uh, a whole lot of a pest species. So if you're interested in armyworm, collect a whole lot of armyworm, bring them back into the lab and see what pops out. So it's a really fascinating research. Um, and we can encourage these species either by good practice and or by releasing them. So there, there are companies which actually breed these parasitoid wasps and you can release them en masse, which is called augmented biological control. But also there are lots of ways that you can encourage them just by good practice on a farm. So to talk about the different types of parasitoid wasps that exist, they have very varied lifestyles, life cycles. If you have a look at this picture here, this is a moth life cycle. And we actually have parasitoid wasps that will attack every different stage of that life cycle. Sometimes it's just within a single host and sometimes they will lay their eggs on lots of different hosts. And sometimes they attack one stage like an egg, but they don't actually emerge until they pupate. To give an example of some of these, this is trichogramma. They are an egg parasitite host. You can see um, laying the egg on there um, on the, the fruit fly. Here we have another one. This is microflitis and a quite gross video of the larvae, which is hatching out of the caterpillar here. Then we have the ones that will lay multiple eggs on the outside of the caterpillar. And again, quite fascinating and gruesome, this idea of that coming out. So I'm skip through because it slows down my video a bit. And we also have species that will attack the pupator stage and then emerge later. Now, these species are very, very small. So it can be actually hard to know whether you've got any of these good bugs in your garden or in your fields and whether they're doing a good job or not. But there are signs that you can look out for. Often, if you're looking at caterpillars, this is one at the top, which is chock-a-block full of eggs. But also, if you're finding dead caterpillars in the fields, you can often look for the exit wounds of if there's a larger larvae where it's come out. So just inspecting the dead ones that are around in the field can give you an idea. This one down here is a carcass surrounded by the pupae that have come out. So they emerge from the body of the caterpillar and then they spin this little nest and they sit in that until they hatch out. So that's a really good sign to look out for too. Now aphids are another pest group which is really, really highly parasitized. Uh, and you can see with this picture here, the little green ones are the normal aphids. The browner ones here are the ones that have been parasitized. And these big brown ones are the ones that have been mummified. So that's when the parasite has actually grown inside. It's created a mummy basically out of the shell of the aphid and then hatched out. And you can see here just what a high parasitoid load there is there. You know, most, over half at least, of those aphids have been attacked by parasitoid. And people may think that beneficials can't actually have that much impact when you've got a whole field that's overrun with pests. But if you're having a good year, and you haven't sprayed, you can, these beneficials can actually make a huge difference to the pest and it can actually be the difference between whether there's any kind of economic damage to the crop or not. Um, also, so discolored eggs is another thing we haven't got a very good picture for here because again, very small um, and looking out for adult wasps, but with the, with the idea that they are very small and quite difficult to identify. So what can we do to protect them? Basically, natural vegetation is going to be a really, really important part of this. Um, outside of the paddocks, having things like shelter belts and, and remnant vegetation can really help to preserve these stocks, not just because um, it gives them habitat, but also resources. So you'll notice with some of these beneficial insects, they're only predators or parasitoids at one stage of their life cycle, especially with things like parasitoids. When they're adults, they often eat nectar, so they need flower resources. Um, which means they need quite a diverse environment in which to survive. If you've got those diverse natural native vegetations on the side of the crops, it's much easier for those beneficials to move in. It's important to monitor and use those signs that I talked about to see if natural enemies are keeping pests in check, because if there's lots around, it means it's a really good idea to try and hold off spraying a little bit longer to let them have a go at doing their work. You um, yeah, can look at the signs of the parasitism, and also look at how these pest populations change over time. And my last point here, which leads into Rob's talk, which is coming up next, is that use the pest, if you do have to spray and if insecticide use is needed, use the most selective ones that you can. So the ones that are really targeted to the pests that you need to control um, and really, really try and limit the use of broad spectrum insecticides. 
But Rob actually has a, a more insight into this because he's got more fine scaled information about which exact chemicals will affect which different types of beneficials. So that is who we are handing over to now. We will definitely have time for questions at the end. Um, so keep writing them into the chat if you've got any already. Um, and Rob and I will both join you in, um, in answering those questions at the end of the presentation. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, I assume you can all hear and see me now. Um, yeah, I'm Rob, I'm also from CESA, like Lizzie, and I'm gonna be talking today about um, a fairly large research program that we've been working on here at CESAR over the last year or so, um, uh, looking specifically at the impact of pesticides on natural enemies of Australian grain pests. Um, while this is focused on grains, a lot of it's, uh, um, a, lot, a lot of the findings can potentially um, expand to other crops as well. So um, I guess my first slide is uh, what are natural enemies and why do they matter, which is something that Lizzie uh, pretty well answered. But um, yeah, basically to, to sum up, um, they're predators and parasitoids that attack pests. Uh, but when we say pests here, um, a lot of the things that they attack may never actually become pests because of the work that has been carried out by these natural enemies, just going about living their, living their lives, um, yeah, predating on or parasitizing all the, the diverse range of um, organisms that live within and around cropping systems, making it so that they never become a pest in the first place. Um, and it's been estimated that tens to potentially over a hundred billion dollars worth of um, pest control value is provided worldwide each year by these natural enemies, um, just through yield losses prevented and um, prevented control measures that farmers don't need to carry out. So really, really important um, just from an economic perspective, uh, as well as all the environmental values and that type of thing that Lizzie touched on. Um, of course, despite the fact that natural enemies are great, um, most farmers uh, are not lucky enough to be able to entirely rely on them to control pests. Um, and as a result, um, pesticides are a very important uh, go-to tool for many farmers basically throughout the world. Um, and of course, Pesticides are very effective at preventing yield loss. They, they do their job, they can knock out your pests um, and make and protect your crop most of the time. So all good. Of course, we're all aware that there's numerous downsides to using, in, uh, to using pesticides, particularly insecticides and miticides, which is what I'm focused on here. These can include things like uh, resistance, which is um, where over time uh, populations can evolve to become immune to a certain chemical, um, particularly this is the case if the chemical's overused, um, as well as um, secondary pest outbreaks, which is where natural enemies come in, because it can be, um, it can be a farmer who has, say, you've got a problem with pest A, you get out your sprayer, you spray your crop, cool, we've wiped out pest A, all good, not a problem anymore. But you might have at the same time knocked out a beneficial species, one that you possibly didn't know was there at all, and one that had been happily going around chomping on pest B. Um, and now all of a sudden pest B is suddenly a problem when you didn't know it was there before. And so that's that's what's referred to as a secondary pest outbreak. Um, and so that's that's something that we're really interested in in trying to avoid. And it, it's something that farmers are, of course, becoming much more aware of um, throughout the world. And this is moving many farmers to adopt um, integrated pest management. Integrated pest management basically is just just means uh, applying multiple method, multiple methods of pest control, and it's about trying to find an optimal solution to pests using a combination of measures. And this diagram I've got here it's just the very basic um, the integrated pest management pyramid um, that's referred to. Basically, the idea of it is that you want to your um, you want to, if possible, use things lower down the pyramid and only move higher up the pyramid uh, as you as becomes necessary. So, uh, and the majority of farmers are doing this type of stuff anyway, even if they're really not not aware of integrated pest management as a concept. For example, cultural control, the bottom bottom tier on there, um, that could just mean things like using resistant cultivars, which the majority of farmers are gonna be doing anyway. Um, physical mechanical control, kind of same story. That could just be things like basic hygiene practices. So stopping pest infested material from entering your site, or for example, if you've got greenhouse crops in the site and you can erect physical, physical barriers to stop um, uh, pests coming in, then that's just, yeah, that, that's what we're talking about when we get to physical and mechanical. Um, biological control, of course, is the stuff that Lizzie's just been talking about where natural enemies control your pests. And this can either happen by itself just through, um, just through 
the natural processes of natural enemies living in and around the cropping systems, moving in of their own accord and doing what they do, or it can happen with human assistance, what Lizzie mentioned, um, augmentative biological control, where farmers can get hold of um, uh, certain species of natural enemies and deliberately release them in their fields. And then finally, the, uh, the top tier, the one we would like to avoid if possible, but of course often can't, um, is chemical control. And we'd of course like to use less toxic chemicals um, before we move on to the really more toxic chemicals stuff. Um, of course, chemical and biological control can be very difficult to reconcile with one another. Um, as I was just talking about, the idea that um, a chemical that can knock out a pest can potentially knock out a natural enemy as well. Um, so how do, we, how do we use these two methods together? How do we, I guess, use the whole triangle if we need to and incorporate biological control in with chemical control? Well, there's a number of potential solutions. Um, we could do things like carry out strategic spraying. So moving away from say calendar based or prophylactic sprays and only spraying based on certain criteria. For example, we could monitor our crops for pests uh, and only spray when they reach a specific threshold. Also, if we have a good understanding of the life cycle of a pest, we can make predictions about when it might be most uh, the biggest problem. So for example, many pests life cycles are driven by weather. So if we can track temperature over the season, we can get a good idea of when the pest might be a problem and just spray at key times. Or we could also spray um, strategically in key areas as well. So for example, spraying around the edge of a field as pests are moving in instead of spraying the whole field. These are all, all ways that we can spray strategically in such a way as to preserve natural enemies. The other thing we can do, and this kind of gets back to the top tier of the pyramid, the less toxic versus more toxic, is we can use more selective chemicals. And that's kind of what I'll cover for the rest of the talk here. Um, so what we were very interested in uh, doing, oh, sorry, <laughs> skip, forward, skip forward too far. Um, yeah, so, uh, and as I said, uh, we're interested in, in talking about uh, using more selective chemicals. Uh, and farmers are really interested in getting an idea of what chemicals can they use that are safer for natural enemies in their fields. Um, and the interest has been, been really big to the point that there's, there's guides being created to two big cropping industries in Australia, both the cotton industry uh, and the horticultural vegetable production industry um, have had guides produced for them um, that are shown on the screen here that give them a, that designed to guide farmers in what chemicals they can use that are most compatible with natural enemies. Um, the, what these look like, I've got, you can see the table I've got down the bottom of the screen, that's the extract from the cotton guide. Basically, you've got, um, it, it's a matrix with one axis is chemicals, so that's the, uh, the vertical axis, and then the horizontal axis, we've got uh, the groups of natural enemies we're interested in, and, we're, and in the cells where they intersect, these guides just give a rating as to how toxic that chemical is to those uh, organisms. Um, and these guides are super popular amongst the, uh, the, the, their industries respectively. And there was quite a bit of um, demand from the grains industry for something similar. So that's what we've been working on uh, over the last couple of years. So in order to make a guide like this, what we obviously needed was first to work out what was gonna go on those two axes. So the chemicals on one and the natural enemies on another. To get an idea about chemicals, we um, uh, consulted fairly widely with, um, with growers and agronomists in the chemical industry and came up with this list that we've got at the top of the screen there. Um, and same with natural enemies, we consulted the academic literature and growers and such and came up with, uh, with, with seven key groups of natural enemies. Um, obviously, there's, as, as Lizzie mentioned, there's potentially thousands of organisms out there that could uh, act as natural enemies. Um, we obviously couldn't, couldn't experiment on thousands as much as we'd possibly like to. Um, so we basically uh, ended up deciding to pick um, a few key species out of these seven groups. These seven groups being predatory beetles, hoverflies, parasitoid wasps, predatory bugs, lacewings, predatory mites, and of course, spiders. So once we had that um, there, this is our nice, blank table, blank page, so many possibilities uh, open to us. Um, the first step was to, of course, look at what data was out there already. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel if there was relevant data there. So if there was um, reliable studies that used uh, similar chemicals at similar application rates, as is relevant to the grain industry, we used them. Uh, but then to go beyond that, we started carrying out our own research. And we were very keen to, um, we were very keen to do research that would be um, uh, comparable to existing research uh, from elsewhere in the world or other research from Australia and potentially research that might be carried out in the future as well. So we wanted to be able to say, get, the, get an idea of how chemical A affects species A, 
Um, and then if a new chemical comes on the market in the future, that we could easily test that and compare that with ours and go, okay, chemical A affects species A like this. And okay, let's do the study. Okay, this new chemical affects it in this way. And we can want to be able to directly compare them. So to do that, we followed as closely as possible protocols set out by the International Organization for Biological Control. And we use this uh, device you see on screen, which is called a Potter Tower. Basically, it's a way to um, uh, deliver a precision amount of a liquid to a certain space. And so, in this case, we mixed up our mixed up all our um, our, our, active, our chemicals that we were interested in. We mixed them up to the maximum registered field rate in grain crops in Australia, along with a, a smaller ten percent rate, just to do some comparisons. And use this Potter Tower to apply them. Uh, to a petri dish at a rate per square centimetre that's equivalent to the rate per square centimetre that a farmer would apply it to their fields in a real life situation. So trying to mimic exactly what a farmer would do, but on the micro scale. Um, after we sprayed our petri dishes, we gave them about half an hour to an hour to dry and then threw in a bunch of um, uh, individuals of the various arthropod species, potentially gave them some kind of food supply to help them help them survive and then monitored their mortality over the next, uh, over the next two to three days to get an idea of how bad how much this chemical impacted them so these are our initial overall findings so these are just draft findings at this stage we're hoping to uh have these all finalized in the next couple of weeks and when they are the um this table and the surrounding guide bullet will be available for download from our website. Um, so I'll give you the URL to check back to at the end. Um, but this is what we ultimately uh, have come up with this big table here. Obviously, there's a couple of little gaps left to be filled, mostly in the hoverflies and the spiders column. Um, and these gaps are just there because these are species that um, we can't get from a commercial supplier. Lizzie, Lizzie mentioned that there's commercial suppliers out there who will grow, who will produce, um, breed and sell certain bugs for you. Unfortunately, hoverflies and spiders are, aren't in that category in Australia. So we've been having to either catch them from the wild or breed them, by, breed them ourselves, making those two a little bit more challenging. But for most of the rest of it, we've, uh, we've filled in the majority of the gaps, as you can see. Um, so just, I guess, one of the initial Oh, oh, skipping too far again. Uh, so one of the um, one of the initial findings I want to draw your attention to, and this is one that was not a surprising finding, but we were glad of that, um, is these uh, group of chemicals here at the top of the table. Um, these are all chemicals um, that are generally considered to be um, either fairly selective or fairly soft. They're they're marketed as such, and farmers use them as such. And these include uh, things like chlorantranilaprol, which is a, a selective caterpillar insecticide, and then aphidopropin and flumic which are selective chemicals that um, target aphids, um, along with um, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis and NPV, nuclear polyhedron virus, which are both, um, both uh, pathogens of caterpillars. And what you can see, um, if you look across the table, uh, at all these chemicals is that they, they do indeed um, seem to be fairly selective. They, um, they're selectively, uh, they don't do much harm to our natural enemies because they're designed to uh, target certain species of pests. So that was um, the fact that we found that that is the case as many people have uh, assumed um, was, was pretty good news for us. Um, the next one I wanna draw your attention to though is, is further down the table. And this one was a bit of a surprise. Um, Gamma cyhalothrin is from a, the group of insecticides known as synthetic pyrethroids. And these are generally considered to be pretty nasty, pretty broad spectrum things that will wipe out most most stuff in a field but if you have a look at across the table there's a few groups there that we um that we found to uh not be particularly negatively affected by it in particular rove beetles hoverflies um and and spiders uh they all seem to be relatively resistant to this which was a bit of a surprise um and we're gonna we're gonna do some more research on this which i'll touch on at the end but um yeah interesting finding that i wanted to highlight there that gamma cyhalothron wasn't necessarily as as nasty as we expected it to be. Um, I guess drawing your attention to uh, some of the uh, columns on here, I want to highlight the I guess the three groups of organisms that seems to be reasonably tough and resilient. Those being the rove beetles, the hoverflies again, and and spiders as well. As you can see, these are three groups that have lots of lots of green cells on there. Um, fairly low um, mortality uh, as a result of a lot of the chemicals we applied, um, which is a good sign for the possibility of these to be used in, um, in integrated pest management. To, it shows that they're reasonably compatible with a wide range of chemicals. Just to, um, to highlight them a little bit, so uh, rove beetles, um, um, these are basically ground-dwelling beetles that um, 
that prey on a whole lot of things, including thrips and other things. Um, and what's really good news for farmers is that this is a species that you can get um, from commercial suppliers. So farmers who are interested in carrying out uh, integrated pest management um, uh, measures that use both biological and chemical. Um, if, if something like thrips is a problem for you, then rove beetles are a great option that are compatible with a wide range of chemicals. Um, hoverflies, Liz talk, Lizzie talked about them a bit as well. Um, uh, also great, they serve as pollinators as adults because they don't just look like bees, they act like bees. And then their little larvae that I've got in the corner there, which look like kind of, uh, I tell people they look like legless caterpillars if I'm trying to be uh, trying to be very positive about them. But really I say that they're maggots because that's what they are, they're fly larvae. Um, but yeah, and these are really voracious predators that within the, the week or so that they are in their larval stage can eat up to 300 aphids each. And then given each female hoverfly can lay several hundred eggs, you can, you can see how much, how how much potential one one hoverfly has uh, to control aphids over time. Um, unfortunately, as I said, these aren't commercially available. So farmers who are wanting to integrate these into their pest management programs will have to do it just by creating the right environment for them, which could include um, as Lizzie mentioned, planting flower banks and that type of thing, particularly yellow, big clumps of yellow flowers they like. So um, brassicas like canola they love um, and will come and pollinate your canola for you. But um, you can just uh, plant plant banks of wild brassica, brassica flowers around fields, that type of thing. Uh, as well as things like, like yellow native flowers, like big clumps of wattle flowers, they seem to be really attracted to as well. So once again, another species that, um, uh, well, another group of organisms, sorry, that is uh, able to be used um, in, in, in conjunction with a wide range of chemicals in integrated pest management programs. Um, so I guess, what does, what does this mean for growers? So um, one of the things, of course, that we can do with, now that we have this information is that growers can use it to make informed choices about, more, about using generally less toxic chemicals. So uh, as you can see, a lot of those chemicals towards the top of the, the chart, they have a lot of green on there, um, obviously um, fairly consistent with um, uh, fairly harmless to most natural enemies. Uh, so even just at a base case, if you're uh, if you don't have time for monitoring or don't have the resources for it, then you can just pick a pick one of the least uh, the, the pick, pick the chemical from this list that does the job of controlling your target pest with the least off target damage. Um, if if you're in a position where you're able to carry out monitoring or you've got good local knowledge about the beneficials in your area, then of course you can you can tailor the chemicals you use to select um, to select a chemical that will control the pest while doing the least harm to whatever key beneficial groups you might have in your environment. Um, and of course, this can hopefully be helpful to farmers developing IPM programs that incorporate both chemical and biological control. So this is where we're at now. We're, we're gonna uh, finalize this very soon, hopefully fill in the last few gaps very soon, but what then? So there's still a few more steps to go in this research. Um, and the first one that we're most interested in is looking at sublethal effects of chemicals. So um, we're particularly interested in doing this for some of the low toxicity chemicals, plus things like gamma cyhalothrin, where we had a relatively surprising result. Um, and what, we, what this means is that we want to know what the chemicals can do to, a, to a, an organism, even if it doesn't necessarily kill it. Um, for example, an organism could survive being sprayed by a chemical, um, but then have impacts throughout its, its life going forward. It might reduce its longevity, which would mean it potentially preys on less organisms, so is less effective at biological control. It could also reduce its fecundity, causing it to have less offspring, once again, having a negative impact to biological control. They can even do some quite weird things, particularly with parasitoids, where certain chemicals can distort the sex ratio of offspring. So obviously with parasitoids, it's only the female wasps that will do the parasitizing. Um, so if an insecticide um, can hit them and they survive it, but then go on to have say many more male offspring than they normally would as opposed to female ones. And that's also gonna negatively impact their ability to carry out uh, biological control services. So while we've got all this data on, on the lethality of these chemicals, it's also important to look into the uh, sublethal effects that these chemicals might have. And so that's the next step. Going beyond that, we'll also be looking at chemicals applied as seed treatments. All the stuff we've looked at thus far is stuff that's applied as a foliar spray. And then we'll also go on to move to looking at um, more realistic field trials going forwards. 
So at that point, I'll wrap it up. Um, that's the URL at the top of the screen where we will be posting the, uh, the table once it becomes available in the next few weeks. So feel free to check back there um, or click me an email if you want it and I can send it through when it's ready. Um, and with that, I guess I'll, I'll thank our partners in this, the um, Grains Research and Development Corporation who has funded this work and the University of Melbourne. Um, and I'm happy to hand back over to Lizzie to deal with questions and such. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much, Rob. That's a really good summary of the research you've been doing over quite a long time now. It's awesome. Um, there's actually one question for you in the chat already, which is about the white blanks in the table, which I'm sure you probably anticipated. Yep. Um, when are we going to see those white blanks filled in? Uh, soon. So some of them, some of them, as soon as I finish this talk, I'm going to go back to count how many um, <laughs> caterpillar, uh, how many caterpillar parasitides have, have have died based on certain things. So um. Uh, most of them soon. Um, hoverflies and spiders a bit less soon, unfortunately, because we're uh, have got a got the only um, Australian hoverfly breeding program is happening in our, in our lab <laughs> just behind me right now. Uh, so hoverflies will happen when whenever the hoverflies decide to lay eggs, and spiders, unfortunately, are probably going to have to wait till next summer because uh, we have uh, not many spiderlings of the kind we're after happening at the moment. But uh, they're coming soon, um, and the uh, the graph with a lot of those blanks filled in uh, the Table will be online in a couple of weeks, hopefully. Thanks for the question, Richard. Do we have any, anyone else that would like to throw us a question about beneficials? It's obviously a humongous topic, and I've given you a very, very superficial overview today. It's always hard to know what the, um, the knowledge level in the audience will be like before you start as well, but hopefully you learned something today, but always keen to go into more detail if anybody has more detailed questions. Liz, is that the right link for the survey? You're on, you're on mute. Yes, Lizzie, yeah, I've just put it up for everybody. That's and... the pest facts. Oh, sorry, I just copied it onto my browser. Sorry about that, I'll put that one up. Um, <laughs> and I'll also mail it out to everybody so they've got the um, ability to answer it through email. Get that on there again. Thanks for pointing that out. I mean, I love people going through the pest facts because there's lots of good information there, but we'd also love to hear about what um, kind of webinars you'd like to have in the future because we've got a, a range of different skills at CESA and we love working with local land services. So always happy to do different types of webinars and hopefully you can join us for the Red Legged Earth Mite one in March as well. It would be great to hear from everybody because it does guide us for the future and um, this is a topic that isn't going to go away. I think it's only going to get more interest as we go along. Um, I can't thank you both enough. I think it was really fascinating and um, we'll gather up some resources and send those out in the email as well as the um, recording uh, once we get that up online. So thank you and hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. Yeah, definitely. Thanks everyone for coming. Really lovely to see so many people on board today. And you can always get in touch with me and Rob through the CESA website as well. We're always happy to answer beneficial insect questions. Yeah, thanks for having us, everyone. Thank you, guys. It was great. Just want more. Okay.